Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Debbie Sasko. I'm the AVP of Information Services, and I have with me today two of representatives from the Intermodal Interchange Executive Committee, which is the group that oversees the UIIA. I have Kevin Lotech from Reliable Transportation Specialists. He's uh, the motor carrier rep that's on the call, and I also have Alice Moraldo from Maersk, who is the ocean carrier, one of the ocean carrier representatives on the IIEC. I also have with me Sherry Parnell and Stacy Fagan, who are two of our program managers, as well as Mark Blueball, who is IANA's general counsel. This webinar is the second in a two-part series that will provide an overview of specific sections of the UIA that are often questioned by UIA participants. Hopefully, it will provide a clearer understanding of the terms in these provisions within the agreement. We did have a previous webinar that was held at the end of May that covered equipment return, dispute resolution, and binding arbitration. That session was recorded, and it is available on the IANA website under past webinars. Today's session, uh, we're going to cover the role of the Intermodal Interchange Executive Committee, specific sections of the administrative procedures of the UIA that deal with EP addenda reviews and also modifications to the agreement, as well as to try to cover some general FAQs that we receive often from participants. We'll reserve some time at the end of the session to take any questions that are submitted. And if so, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. First, going to take a look at the role of the IAC in the makeup of the Intermodal Interchange Executive Committee. There are 10 members of the committee that consist of motor carriers, railroads, ocean carriers, and equipment leasing companies. Uh, the IIAC is the group that has the oversight of the administration of the UIIA and is the group that continually reviews that document to ensure it reflects current industry practices. The IIC also makes decisions regarding any changes to the agreement. There are additional processes that uh, take place if there are modifications to the UIA, and we'll review those on a later slide. And each year, the IIC membership is reviewed by a subcommittee uh, called the IIC Appointment Committee. This committee is comprised of industry representatives and is appointed by ANO's Board of Directors, and we'll go into more detail about the membership process as well. This slide provides a list of the current 2019 IIC membership. Uh, the primary members that you see to the left of the slide are those that are vote on the issues that come before the committee, and then you also have the alternates on uh, the right-hand side of the screen. Those are members that would serve as a voting member if one of the primary members is unable to attend a meeting or a conference call. The IAC representatives that have joined us today will be providing an overview of various activities that the IAC is involved in. I'll now turn it over to uh, Kevin Lotech, who is one of the motor carrier IAC representatives, and he'll provide an overview of the IAC appointment process. Kevin? Thank you, Debbie. The IAEC appointment process, we're going to go through it real quick, and I've got a couple comments. Um, the IAC appointment committee, which is IAC, is appointed by Anna's board of directors and is compromised of four sitting IANA members that are also UIIA participants. There's one representative from each sector, rail, marine, motor carrier, and most recently equipment leasing company. Committee membership is reviewed on an annual basis by the IIEC appointment committee. This review is conducted in the fourth quarter of each year. Notification is sent to UIA participants each year to solicit IIEC membership candidates. This is normally sent out uh, in October of each year. UIA participants interested in serving on the IIEC should complete the IIEC appointment form and include a copy of their resume. The information should be sent via email to debbie.sasco at intermodal.org. Applicants received that meet the IIEC appointment criteria will then be forwarded back to the IAC for review and consideration. The IAC will submit their recommendations for any changes to the IIEC membership for the following year to IANA's Board of Directors for their final decision at the January IANA Board of Directors meeting. The board appoints six members as you saw on the previous slide, for each mode, three voting members and three alternates with equipment leasing having one voting member and two alternates. 
if someone's interested in serving, I would like to point out that while considering this, it should be a semi long term commitment from the applicant. It takes time as well as uh, constant participation to serve effectively. And um, besides the three times that Debbie pointed out we meet per year, we also schedule conference calls to keep up on our business agenda and keep it moving as necessary. Debbie? Thank you, Kevin. This next slide uh, provides an overview of how the EP addenda review process works and the IAC's involvement in that as well. When equipment providers submit uh, requests to amend their addenda, they have to do so in, in a minimum of 90 days prior to the effective date that they want those changes to go into effect. Revisions that are related to economic terms in the EP's addenda, such as free time and per diem, are not within the purview of the IAC's review. So they don't review those types of addenda changes, but the 90-day effective date is still in, in place. So if you have a change to your addendum, if you're an equipment provider and it's related to a free time or per diem, you need to make sure that you take into consideration that the effective date is going to be 90 days from the date you submit it to our office, even though it doesn't have to go for review. Non-commercial uh, changes, they are reviewed by the IIAC and they go to the modes that are representing the party that submitted it. So, for example, if an ocean carrier submitted a change, it would go to the ocean carrier and motor carrier representatives on the IIAC for review. The staff does an initial review of the addenda revision to determine or identify any potential conflicts that it sees based on prior revisions it has reviewed and uh, issues that have been identified by the IIC in the past. And then we prepare that information to go to the IIC uh, modal members for review. And they have 15 business days once they receive that information to review the document and su submit any comments that they have in regards to the proposed changes. At the end of that comment period, we then compile the committee's comments and send them back to the party, uh, the EP that submitted the change. And uh, oftentimes, the equipment provider will make the suggested changes that the IIC modal members have requested. But if they don't agree with that and they want to move forward with the proposed language as they submitted it, then a conference call would be held between the modal IAC reps and the equipment provider to try to reach uh, some type of compromise in regards to the proposed change. Once we do have the change, the effective date can't be any less than 30 days. So you take into consideration the 90 days that you have to submit it in advance. And then after, if it goes to the committee for review, it at least has to have a 30-day effective date once the a committee approves the language that the provider has submitted. All motor carriers are notified of all the changes in an equipment provider's addenda, and if they get a revision that they don't agree with, and they ha certainly have the right to select not to do business with that specific provider, and if they do so, then they should also ask their insurance agent to remove the additional insured for that particular provider so that their company no longer shows valid for that equipment provider. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Al Smeraldo so he can uh, go over the next slide for you. Al? Good afternoon, everyone. The base agreement of the UIA, within that agreement, any signatory can submit a request to modify the agreement. And over the years, we've received several suggestions. And if you look at the document, you can actually see the revisions that have occurred over the years, including some that we've changed this year. So you submit your formal request in writing to include the proposed language to be considered. Uh, the purpose and the intent of the proposed language, it gets submitted to uh, Debbie Sasco via email. And then the requests are forwarded to the committee and, and within our next meeting, our next scheduled meeting, those topics come for discussion. Hey, thank you, Al. Adding on to what Al had covered there, um, if there are modifications to the UIIA that are approved by the IIC during one of their meetings or conference calls, that does require a three-fourths majority vote of the voting members in attendance at that meeting. So it would be eight of the ten uh, IIC members would have to approve a modification to the agreement in order for it to pass. And once that proposed change passes through the committee, then it is sent out to all the UI participants for a 30-day comment period. And at the end of that comment period, we forward and compile all of those comments that have been submitted by participants in regards to any concerns they have relating to the change that's being proposed. And those are 
forwarded to the committee for review and consideration before a final determination is made by the committee whether to move forward with that change or sometimes they may modify the change that was proposed initially. We just had something like that recently happen where a change to uh, Section E2E had gone out for a 30-day comment period. It went back to the committee, and based on the comments that were received, the committee decided to clarify it further, and it went out for an additional 30-day comment period. And we recently uh, just sent a notice out indicating that the committee had, we had not received any comments on that second 30-day period, so the proposed revision was going to be effective July 1st. So when we send the notification out of, of the committee's decision regarding a change, the effective date of that change has to be at least 15 days from the notice that we send out. And then we will post all of those changes on the UIA website in regards to the copy of the new agreement, as well as the notice that was sent to UIA participants. We'll now move on to cover some of the frequently asked questions that we often receive from participants. And the first slide kind of outlines questions that we get more often from new motor carriers versus existing ones. But we always get questioned as to uh, what is the UIA and why should I join? The UIA is, is actually the standard interchange contract between the motor carrier and the equipment providers that they do business with to uh, interchange intermodal equipment. What IANA does under the agreement is we collect and disseminate information related to that contract, such as the participating party signature page that the parties execute to become a signatory to the agreement, as well as insurance information that the equipment providers require in order for that motor carrier to be approved to do business with them under the UIIA. Other questions we get is why should a company participate in the UIIA? And the biggest benefit for the UIIA in regards to motor carriers would be that it eliminates your need to sign and execute separate contracts with all the equipment providers that you do business with. You execute the one UIA contract, the, the signature page of our agreement, and then you submit, have your insurance agent submit one certificate of insurance to us that covers the equipment providers that you're going to do business with. And that provides you your contract, your interchange contract with all the equipment providers versus you having to do send that information to each and every provider that you're trying to uh, do business with under the UIA. Other benefits that the agreement offers is, again, the execution of one contract and one certificate of insurance. We also provide you with access to your account 24-7, and you can check the status of that as well as the status of your drivers if you maintain your drivers under the Intermodal Driver Database, which is another program that IANA offers and the rails currently use to access their facilities. So you have one web interface that you can manage both of that information through. Your insurance agent also can submit insurance on behalf of your company online. We require all agents to be registered to submit insurance online to us. That allows you to, if for some reason you have an issue that pops up over the weekend when or on after IANA's business hours, you'll be able to have your agent submit that information and it'll go into place immediately. So there's you don't have to wait for IANA's office to open or wait for someone a customer service representative uh, to take care of that for you. We also send automatic notices regarding policy renewals. If your policy is coming up for renewal, uh, we send a notice 30 days in advance as well as seven days prior to the policy being expired and letting you know that we need to receive that information the day before that policy is to expire. Our system in the UIA expires insurance at 12.01 a.m., the day of expiration. I do know that oftentimes we'll get motor carriers that'll say, well, my policy's good through the end of the day. Unfortunately, not all insurance policies work that way, so we have to expire it at 12.01 a.m., the day of the expiration. So it's important to make sure that your agent is aware of that and that they make sure that they get that insurance submitted to us prior to your expiration date. We also have the street interchange application that we offer as a benefit to UIA participants. Both motor carriers and equipment providers can use this application to facilitate street turns and street interchange transactions between the two parties. It'll capture an electronic record for the, when there's a street interchange involving two motor carriers. It captures when that transfer takes place from motor carrier one to motor carrier two and there's a electronic record of that that can be viewed at a future time should a dispute arise as to when that transfer took place. For a street turn, 
it'll capture when the move went from an import to an export move for purposes of the equipment provider applying free time and per diem. We have a terminal feed service, which some of you I'm sure are familiar with, that we send UIA interchange status information to marine facilities as well as container yards and depots on behalf of UIA equipment providers. Under the UIA, equipment providers have access to this information, but normally it's their corporate office or maybe one of their satellite offices that accesses that. But it does. they are then required to send it to the terminal. So what the terminal feed service allows us to do is to send that information to the facilities directly. So hopefully expediting to make sure that that facility you're going into knows whether your company is either approved or not approved for that specific equipment provider. We often receive questions on what insurance is required under the UIA and, and why it's required. The slide outlines requirements set forth in the base agreement, which are auto liability for one million combined single limit. This policy has to cover any auto, all owned and hired, or scheduled and hired autos. We do not accept scheduled autos only. General liability for one million per occurrence. This is to cover any type of liability that would occur on the facility when the driver's away from the truck. Under that GL policy, no portion of it can be self-insured, and the reason for that is that there's no regulatory agency that approves self-insurance for general liability. The Trucker's Uniform Intermodal Interchange Endorsement, and a lot of agents get this confused with trailer interchange, which is a type of insurance coverage. But the Trucker's Endorsement is a hold harmless endorsement that needs to be made part of the motor carrier's auto policy. Trailer interchange on the other hand, is an actual specific type of coverage that some equipment providers require that covers the physical damage to the non-owned equipment while it's in the motor carrier's care, custody, and control. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, these are some of the other types of insurance that equipment providers may require a motor carrier to have in place in order to do business with them. And that would be cargo, which is simple evidence of cargo just to confirm that the motor carrier has cargo in place trailer interchange, as I just mentioned, and workers' compensation and employers' liability. We do have some providers that require that as well. The base agreement requires that all providers be listed as additional insured on the auto liability policy, and that's in the order, and we often get asked, why do I have to list a provider as an additional insured on my policy? And that's because the equipment provider wants to make sure that they have first-party coverage should any claim occur. And there are also some providers that will require a motor carrier to list them on general liability and trailer interchange as an additional insured as well. This slide just continues on with some of the insurance. As I mentioned, the trailer interchange, there's a lot of agents confuse what type of trailer interchange the equipment providers are asking for. Many times we'll get trailer interchange that indicates it's only in, in place while the trailer is attached to the truck. This has to be in place while the equipment is under the motor carrier's control. So it has to cover comprehensive and collision, not just fire and theft. That's another issue that we run into with agents sometimes. You'll, you'll have a, a trailer interchange policy that's just covering fire and theft and not comp and collision. So you want to make sure that if your agent has any questions in regards to the type of trailer interchange that the equipment providers are looking for, please have them contact our office and we'll be happy to go over that with them. I mentioned why you need to list the equipment providers as additionally insured so that they have the first party coverage. And then motor carriers would like often want to know, what do I need to do business with? What, what information do I need to provide you in order to do business with this equipment provider? And what I can do is I'm going to show you on screen in the application where you can find that information. So if we go into the UIA account, so if you're on a UIA account and you want to see, you'll, you'll see your home page here. It'll tell you all the equipment providers that you're approved for here. These are the companies that you're valid to do business for under the UIA. And then on this side of the screen, you'll see the companies that you've selected that you'd like to do business with, but that you are missing information in, in order to become approved for them. So for example, if I wanted to see what I needed to do business with Hamburg Sued, I'd simply click on this and scroll down and it would show me that I need the additional insured on the auto liability, the general liability, uh, in order to become approved for Hamburg Sued. So um, that information will always be shaded in pink on the screen if in regards to what information you need to become a, a, approved for a specific provider.
uh, workers' compensation. There are companies that are often exempt for workers' comp for one reason or another. Either they may only do business with their drivers, may be owner-operators, the state may not require it. Those are two of the main reasons that we often get for an exemption. So if your company is exempt for workers' comp, what you would need to do is send us a letter on your company letterhead. It has to be signed by an authorized officer of your company. And what we will do is we'll put in an exemption for your company for one year from the date of the receipt of that letter. It's treated like an insurance policy, so the letter has to include the reason why you're exempt, and we would require that letter to be provided to us each year. If you uh, need an exemption for a particular type of insurance coverage that an equipment provider is requiring, such as cargo, a trailer interchange, or workers' comp, you'd need to contact the equipment provider directly on that since those are their requirements, not the base agreement requirements. It'll be up to that particular provider to determine whether they want to waive that particular type of insurance for you. And one example I can think of uh, off the top of my head is cargo. There are companies that may hold, haul their own goods so they don't carry cargo coverage. So a provider may opt to waive that coverage for a particular motor carrier that's in that scenario. Billing time. That's another question we get often uh, in regards to uh, when does a provider or from the provider side, when do I need to build a motor carrier in which, which time frame? So for per diem, that needs to be 60 days from the date the motor carrier returns the equipment to the provider. And there is a caveat in the agreement under Section E6C, which is the section that covers the per diem billing charges, that if the equipment provider bills the incorrect party, they do have the opportunity to bill the correct party, but they have to do so within a specified time frame that you see on this slide. And in no instance can it be over any more than 90 days from the date on which the equipment was returned. Maintenance and repair charge billing time frames, you can see there's Three in the standard agreement, we have that if the uh, transaction occurs at a standard gate or a man gate, it has to be the billing has to be done within 165 calendar days from the date of interchange at the time the damage was documented, and at an AGS gate, it's 120 calendar days. Over the road repairs are 90 calendar days from the date of the repair, and you may have some equipment providers that adopt a different time frame within their addendum, but it can't be any shorter than 45 days. But if they do so, they have to make that time frame reciprocal for both the equipment provider and the motor carrier. The billing time frames for maintenance and repair can be found under Section E3C of the agreement, and again, per diem is found under E6C. How equipment providers get data from the UIIA, uh, often when a, a motor carrier may get stopped at a facility, they wonder why they're getting stopped if they're showing approved in the UIIA. Equipment providers get data from us in various ways. We have some that get an EDI feed from us that ranges from every 30 minutes to every two hours. We have a few that get the data via XML or API, and then the majority of them use our UI web interface, which requires that they pull web reports of approved and not approved motor carriers on a daily basis. So it may be an instance uh, that if you're at a facility and you're getting stopped and you're showing valid in the UIA, it might be that that particular provider is not subscribing to our terminal feed service where we send that data directly to the facility and they may not have pulled a daily report that up to update their system to show that you're approved. Because motor carrier status changes all the time in the UIA on a daily basis within the day. So a, a company can be approved in the morning and not approved in the afternoon. So that's why the terminal feed service that we have helps in getting that information to the facility so that when you get to the terminal that you don't have problems picking up. We send that data to over 100 intermodal facilities, and we have currently have 23 UI equipment providers, which are the major steamship lines that participate in the UIA that receive that data. We also have a few rail facilities, Union Pacific, Norfolk Southern, and CSX also receive UIA interchange status information on behalf of the steamship lines that subscribe to the terminal feed service as well. Here's a listing uh, of all the facilities or the equipment providers that subscribe to the terminal feed service. And on the UIA website under the motor carrier tab, there's a table out there as well that shows all the facilities that we send the data to as well as what lines that those facilities get data on behalf of.
The Street Interchange app uh, I mentioned earlier, that's a value-added benefit to UIA participants, and it, it provides a web portal that allows you to transact a street interchange or street turn request. That request then goes to the equipment providers that are using that system right now. We have Med Shipping, Hapag Lloyd, Yang Ming, Evergreen, and Hyundai that are using IANA's street interchange application. And if that electronic record that's captured is maintained in the web portal and is available for you to access should you have to do it in regards to a dispute or any type of information that you need related to the transaction that you had submitted. If you're doing business or if you're trying to do a street interchange or a street turn for any other providers other than the five that are listed here, you'll need to contact those providers directly as well as chassis providers. TRAC, DCLI, and FlexiVan are not signatories to the UIA, so if you're trying to street turn their chassis, you need to contact them directly. I believe most of them have a web portal on their website for that as well. This screen here just kind of gives an overview of the homepage that I was just in a few minutes ago from the motor carrier side. You'll see here at the top of the screen has the company's information here. It will tell you your SCAT code, when your next bill date is for your UIIA annual administrative fee, as well as how many equipment providers you're valid for, and also your insurance agent code. The insurance agent code is provided to all motor carriers so that you can manage what agents have access to your account in order to submit insurance online. You would provide that code to them and they would need that along with your SCAT code the initial time they submit insurance for you. After that, then your account would be linked to theirs. The middle section, as I mentioned earlier, uh, shows you the approved and pending equipment providers that you're trying to do may be trying to do business with but not approved for yet. You have the ability to print an, a certificate of insurance if you need to print it for someone. It'll allow you to print the current insurance, and this section gives an overview of the insurance we have on file for your company. The navigation bar on the side has all the functionalities that you would be able to use as an equipment, provi as a equipment provider or a motor carrier participant in the UIIA. If you click on Update EP List, once you're logged into the account, this is an important screen because each year you should go in here and review this to determine if you're still doing business with the providers you've got checked off. If not, then you should update the list and make sure it reflects who you're currently doing business with so that when your agent submits insurance, they know who they need to list as an additional insured as well as what limits or deductibles that they need to meet in order for your company to be approved for those particular equipment providers. There is the ability from that screen, you can either print the EP list and send it to your agent, or you can use this functionality that allows you to email it directly to your agent. So it will, if you use this func feature here, it'll take and download a copy of the EP checklist that you have indicating which providers you've checked off. You can send it to your agent and then they can use that when they submit insurance online to us. If your agent's not registered to submit insurance online to our office, they can go to this link here and then register to submit insurance to us that way. They need to make sure they're registered with us first as an agent before they try to submit insurance on behalf of your company. So with that, Stacy, do we have any questions? We do have a couple questions. If you could comment on the trailer interchange policy, the question is, does it only cover units running under a trailer interchange type of agreement i.e. gray neutral pools, or does it cover units moving under term lease agreements between the EP and the motor carrier? It would have to cover any non-owned equipment that that motor carrier was using while interchanging equipment with that particular provider under the UIIA. The next one is, if I'm interested in serving on the IIC, do I need to wait until October to submit my application? No, there is on the UIA website, we'll go back to that. If you go under either the motor carrier or the equipment provider tab, you'll see this link here that says learn more about the Intermodal Interchange Executive Committee. If you click that and scroll down, there'll be a section here about learn more about the IIC appointment process, and there is a link to the actual appointment process when you click on that. So you can submit your application at any time, but the review process is during the fourth quarter of the year. Uh, why does the UIIA allow EPs to increase their per diem rates all the time? It's not up to the UIIA when an EP modifies their addendum. If, if that 
increase is being done, then it's being done on behalf of that line is the one that's requesting that. And like I it indicated earlier, the IAC does not review commercial issues. So uh, that information we just basically provided as information to the motor carriers that are doing business with that specific provider. But the EP would have to follow the guidelines for modification to their addenda, which means they'd have to give the 90-day effective date of any changes. Why doesn't the UIIA accept insurance through a risk retention insurance company? We do. The UIA does accept risk retention insurance. It may be that some specific equipment providers may not accept that information. If you're doing business with one of those particular types of providers that, or one of those providers that doesn't accept that type of insurance, you'd need to contact them directly. Oftentimes, a motor carrier will purchase a separate policy when they're doing business with a provider that doesn't accept risk retention that only covers when they're doing business with that particular provider. How can I show proof to my insurance agent of the UIIA? Sometimes insurance agents may ask if your company is a participant in the UIIA, and if you're a motor carrier, you need to provide that confirmation. If you go log into your account and do this view current insurance, you'll be able to go to a screen that will allow you to print a copy of your preamble page to the agreement. So by printing that, that usually is what the insurance agents are looking for just to prove that your company is an active participant in the UIIA. Uh, what information has to be included if I want to submit a request for modifications to the UIIA? Okay, I think we covered that in one of the slides, but basically what you need to do is you need to send an email to my attention. In that request, you'd need to include what proposed language you would want the committee to consider as well as uh, the reason why you believe the language needs to be in the UIIA. And then uh, once we get that request, it would then be put before the committee at their next scheduled meeting. Any questions for the IIC members that are on the call? Just a quick question. If we aren't billed for a per diem within 60 days of the end gate, is that a valid reason for dispute? The requirement in the agreement is that a provider has to bill per diem within 60 days from the date the equipment's return. So if you get, if a motor carrier receives a bill and it's beyond that time frame, then what they would need to do is dispute that with the specific equipment provider using the dispute resolution process that they have in their addendum. And then if there's no uh, resolution between the two parties, then they certainly would have the ability to submit that for binding arbitration. Anything else? That is it. Well, I thank everyone for attending. I also want to thank the two IIC members that are on the call, Kevin Lotech and Alice Morado, for their time this afternoon. And again, thank you for your time.